like, hey, I got eight o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so <clears throat> I've had this kind of wonderful journey of 40 years in ophthalmic imaging. And I, I recently retired from Moran Eye Center, and I kind of snuck out the back door. Didn't really have a lot of fanfare. So I wanted to come back and give you a little bit of insight as to what my journey was and to see some cases that I've seen over through the years. And so I started photography at a young age. Um, I didn't take great photographs at that point in time, but uh, I did have a camera in my hand. And my father was a research chemist for Eastman Kodak. So I never paid for a roll of film in my life. Um, he was he had a constant supply in our refrigerator. And so it was a uh, Photography was was actually something I could gra gravitate to. Um, in 1982, uh, this is me in uh, Duke University. I was doing an internship as part of my biomedical communications degree at Rochester Institute of Technology. And uh, so I had a varied experience there. And part of it was to spend a week at the Duke Eye Center. And so I was first introduced to angiography, slit lamp photography, taking fundus photos. And it was fascinating. And I go, well, this is the area that I really want to go in. And so as a result, Duke hired me after I finished my degree. And um, this, so this was the first place that I worked for. And in the dead center is the chairman of the department at the time, Robert Mockamer. Robert Mockamer invented vitrectomy in 1971 at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. And just to his uh, right is... Uh, Dr. Ed Buckley, who's actually the chairman at Duke right now. So this is um, kind of a telling photograph that, that I took at my period of time when I was there. So from 1983 to 1988, I was at Duke. And then from 1988 to 2003, I went to Embry. The biggest reason was I, I wasn't being paid very much when I was at Duke. I was just out of school. And so they could get away with the minimum amount that they could pay me. And so I said, well, let's let's move on to other opportunities to a bigger eye center, a bigger city, and uh, work for these gentlemen over here. The chairman of the department was Tom Auberg at the time. And Dr. Auberg had just started rebuilding the department after a big scandal. Uh, the previous chairman had actually operated on the wrong eye, did a corneal transplant, and then tried to cover up the evidence. His name was Dwight Cavanaugh. And so he was kind of excommunicated from ophthalmology and there was a mass exodus of the faculty. So Dr. Auberg had a challenge in rebuilding the faculty and, and gaining a new reputation for the Emory Eye Center. And then in 2003, uh, so Dr. Auberg was stepping down as chairman and I knew things were gonna change in the wind. So I decided to leave and come out here and work for the Moran Eye Center. So, uh, and I was here for 20 years. These are all the physicians that I've worked for. So Dr. Mockenberg, chairman at Duke, uh, Dr. Auberg, chairman at Emory, and Randy Olson, the chairman here. Uh, some influences in my career were, number one was Don Wong, who was an ophthalmic photographer in New York City. And he came and spent a week with me when I was at Duke, fresh off uh, my graduation. And the one week that I spent with him advanced me months in, in the amount of information that he could impart to me on photography. The, the other three gentlemen are all fine art photographers as well as ophthalmic photographers. Mark Mayo is winning awards. He was the previous director of ophthalmic photography at Emory before I got there. And then he moved to Buffalo and work for uh, Bill Coles, who is Emmy Hartnett's husband. Small world in ophthalmology. Uh, Chava Martoni was the king of slit lamp photography. He wrote the kind of the, the book or the journal article on the tutorial on how to use do slit lamp photography. And he was a, the ophthalmic photographer at Kellogg Eye Center in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Chris Berry was actually the editorial, uh, the editor for the Journal of Ophthalmic Photography for many, many years. And he was in Perth, Australia, at Lion's Eye. 
another wonderful photographer uh, doing landscape photography. So these are kind of some of the award winners that I've had throughout the years. Um, there's a contest through the Ophthalmic Photographer Society that you send images to, and they jury them, and then they exhibit them either at the Academy or at Ascaris meeting. And throughout my career, I've had wonderful examples of different things, of different patients, very colorful things that come into the photography section, <clears throat> not just retina, but slit lamp cornea, neuro, everything that comes, peds, everything that comes to the eye center actually ends up at our doorstep if they're something interesting or something telling for the patient. There's a, another category that's called the eye is art. And so the, the beauty of my mind works with science and tech and art at the same time. And so I was constantly constructing strange things with the images and uh, working a lot in Photoshop when Photoshop came out and uh, doing fun things with images of the eye. Uh, not too many people know this, but I was also doing medical illustration while I was here at Moran Eye Center. And uh, a lot of these were ended up in publications for Emmy Hartnett. Another thing that I did was uh, 3D animation. And so for a short period of time, we were doing uh, video productions. Um, there, now Ethan is taking care of all of that, but I, I dabbled with that as well. I've had uh, images that would, would win awards were ended up on the cover of journals. And the one on the bottom left is actually an illustration that I had on a cover of a journal, thanks to Liliana Warner. I also published a book on ophthalmic photographs called Window to the Soul. You can get it through Blurb. And I also uh, wrote and produced a documentary on discovering fluorescein angiography and actually interviewed the two medical students who uh, worked on it. The, these are the two medical students, Dr. Novotny and Dr. Alvis, who flipped a coin and injected each other. And they ended up with the first human angiogram that they tried to publish through ophthalmology and was rejected. This is actually the rejection letter uh, that was sent uh, back from ophthalmology through the editor, Derek Vale. Said, uh, it, it's already being done by other people, but it really hadn't. And so they got it published through circulation and a method of photographing fluorescence and circulating blood in the human retina. So it's a, a fascinating story of the, uh, one of the biggest developments in history in, in ophthalmic photography circles was, wasn't published in an ophthalmology journal. Now, fluorescein, if it, it's not diluted, actually does not fluoresce. So you actually have to dilute it. So when you inject it into the arm, it mixes with the blood and the proteins and it does fluoresce once you dilute it out to 256 parts. It's also used on St. Patty's Day to color the Chicago River. So that's going to happen in the next month or two. Another thing you can do is uh, you can drop this fluorescein into a, a bottle of water and I, I would photograph it. This is my art with science. You come up with these wonderful kind of mushroom patterns and uh, different things that occur when the dye diffuses through the water. Uh, in 1985, at our vitreo retinal meeting that I attended, but I was also part of the audiovisual component to that, there was a gentleman, an uh, ophthalmologist called uh, Relia Zavoinovich, and he was one of the first ones to use silicone oil to do retinal reattachments. And he had these beautiful photographs that he had taken of his patient's retinas by using a pan fundus lens, the Rodenstock pan fundus lens. So he would photograph them at the slit lamp and he, you would get these wide angle views of what the retina looked like. So Mockamer said, hey, well, these photographs look beautiful. Why don't we try to do the same technique? So these are images that I took um, using a pan fundus lens. So you're holding this lens, big old honking lens on the eye, and you're, you put the patient back and you photograph the slit lamp to minimize the reflections that are on the uh, front of the lens and you're able to take these kind of wide angle photographs of what was going on in the retina. And so uh, 
it, it was, uh, we learned how to put a lens on the eye because we were doing this quite often. And so we got really good at it and, and minimizing the reflections and taking these photographs. I actually published the, an, an article on how to do this um, in the Journal of Ophthalmic Photography. Uh, inventions. So I, I did do a few inventions. I took a, a Heidelberg um, spectralis and I took it apart and I put it onto a, a copy or a uh, microscope stand so that we could do patients that couldn't get up to the chin rest. So there's a number of patients who are limited in their neck movements and their back movements. They're in a wheelchair and you just can't get them up to the chin rest. So we were able to lay them down and, and put this instrument over them in a supine position and do really good OCTs for that. So that was one thing that I put together. We, it ended up, we didn't do enough of that and, and our volume was increasing all the time. So we took it off the stand and we put it on a regular um, stand so that patients could just sit up to it. Um, another thing I invented was taking the projection light out of a projection uh, carousel projector and when the slide falls into the gate, you take a picture of it with a digital camera. And so you could take uh, a remote to the slide projector and a remote to your camera and go click, 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 click. And you get through 84 slides in five minutes. And so it was a quick way to digitize a collection of slides to go from slides to digital. So it worked out pretty well. I still have that. Uh, I still have that projector. Um, now, if you look carefully at this photograph, this is um, you, you can see a shadow that's running vertical through the lens. So part of a clinical trial was to take a picture of what we call the sulcus of the lens. And uh, this was to see if the drug or, the, or whatever the patients were taking in the clinical trial were, was creating cataracts. And so they would measure these photographs and, and make sure that cataracts weren't forming. So we got really good at this. There's an ARED study and an, uh, another study wanted to make sure that the vitamins weren't causing cataracts. And another uh, part of the, uh, there was a new protocol that came out for a, a study on a Parkinson's drug that Sanofi came out with. And the photographers that were doing the study were having difficulty getting pictures and getting certified for the clinical study. So they hired me to go out and help teach these people on how to do slit lamp photography to get certified. So this was the protocol. Um, again, you do a, a slit photograph and then you do these retro illumination photographs. So uh, I, I was willing to travel to Tel Aviv, Milan, Portugal, Paris, Munich, Innsbruck, Ottawa, Montreal, Sunnyvale, New Haven, New York City, and Kirkland. Thanks to the Reading Center and thanks to my skill at doing slit lamp photography. So as a regular photographer, this was a, a wonderful opportunity to go out and photograph these particular areas as well. So it, it was fun for me and I got all these centers certified. Uh, there's been a, a number of innovations that occurred since I started photog ophthalmic photography. Digital imaging, uh, ICG, perfluoro octane, silicone oil, OCTs got better and better, OCTA, RK, LASIK, intracorneal rings, RET cams, non-mid cameras, IOLs, artificial cornea, artificial iris, iris matching, optos, optoview, Heidelberg SLO, non-contact specular, intraocular telescopes, and then uh, gene therapy and anti-VEGF. The, but the biggest innovation that occurred in my period of doing photography is we went from film to digital. And I can't tell you the change in our activity was massively different because now we didn't have to spend an hour in the dark room, souping the film, getting it processed, drying it, bringing it to the physician so that he could read the angiogram and then laser the patient or treat the patient. So it was massively different when in, in instantaneously later, the image was on the screen on a computer and we, we didn't have to sort slides and we didn't have to change, uh, go out and soup the film anymore. So when, a, when an ophthalmologist said at five o'clock in the afternoon that I have an angiogram and I wanna treat this patient, you kinda, you know, your, your shoulders slump and you, you go, oh really, I, that means I'm not gonna leave until six o'clock because I gotta process the film, get it dry and hand it to the doctor. 
So those things don't happen anymore, thank goodness, as a result of doing digital photography. Now, uh, OCT went through those two changes. This is OCT1, OCT2, OCT3, spectralis, and then spectralis high res. And so you can see the evolution of the quality. So really OCT3 re really wasn't useful to see small areas of subretinal fluid um, un until OCT3 came along. Otherwise it was this diffuse area of pixels. You really couldn't appreciate the difference of what was going on. And then when we went to spectral domain OCT, the quality difference was instead of uh, you know 2000 lines per scan, we were doing 40,000 lines per second. So it was a major difference in the quality, as well as being able to see the layers distinctly different. Another thing is uh, you can actually um, do a, a 3D rotation on what this epiretinal membrane. So you can see kind of the structures and the topography of what's going on uh, in this kind of unique view that we didn't have before. OCTA allows us to see now through the layers on uh, kind of an on FOSS view. And so now we see structurally what's going on in, in the subretinal space in an area where blood vessels aren't supposed to be. And so these are, area, these are all examples of choroidal neovascular membranes that are evident in these kind of lower stages. And the beauty is we're, we need no dye in order to do OCTA. So when, when you see this kind of a thing, it also means that red blood cells are still moving through this choroidal neovascular network. Otherwise it wouldn't image. So if there was no circulation in those, then it would be a black space in that area. But there's still movement. But on this particular one on the left, the OCT is flat, but we can still see a membrane in that structure. Uh, it just means it's not actively leaking at this particular point in time but we're, we're still able to see kind of the anatomy of what, where that structure is. And what, if it does start igniting fluid again, then it will elevate the OCT. And, and then here's, oh, let's see. Uh, oh. Here's uh, kind of the on FOSS cross-section as it moves through the retina. And so you can appreciate the layers that are in the upper image as the you see the structural part in the lower image. So artificial iris, artificial cornea, uh, refractive lens, and um, the one in the lower right is actually a uh, intraocular telescope. So patients who have macular degeneration, um, they, they actually have to wear this prototype and see if they're a good candidate for an implant. And it's actually this telescope that enlarges the view about two and a half times so that they can see a little bit better um, with this particular device implanted. And so that was kind of an interesting development. Uh, retinal tax, stainless steel surgical tax used to be used to keep the retina flat for uh, retinal reattachments. And uh, it, it didn't catch on because it turned into this fibrotic response from the retina on the stainless steel surgical tacks. So it was this kind of brief period of time that was being used. Um, this is actually a cobalt plaque on, on the eye that used for treating melanoma. And I think there still is uh, a, a use for that. Silicone oil in the lower left, uh, we still use silicone oil. And this is a uh, Ivantis hydrus implant that allows Schlem's canal to kind of flow a little bit better by uh, implanting this little device. So lots, lots of different developments in ophthalmology. Now refractive. Uh, so there used to be radial keratotomy, hexagonal keratotomy. And this, this was the device that cut away the cornea. And then this is a LASIK patient. So you take the flap and you pull it upside and now you're lasering little cells in order for the cornea to be flatter. And uh, sometimes they develop secondary uh, uh, epithelial cells uh, under the flap. And so that's kind of one of the hazards of it. And then one, some doctor got a, a little creative with doing cuts and ended up kind of hacking away at this particular cornea. 
So this is an example of what not to do, I guess. Choroidal neovascular membrane. So we see this a lot. And uh, originally it was treated with lasers. So the, the white area of the, that you can see almost down to the sclera on this patient with presumed ocular histoplasmosis was treated with a, a laser for focal treatment. So focal treatment basically created a giant scotoma in, in an area of the papillomacular bundle on this particular case. And we, when we did angiograms, they would look and see if this was classic or occult and how many microns away from the fovea. And a, a lot of things came into the consideration of how much laser to do, whether to how close you want to get to the fovea when you do the laser. And so there was a lot of calculating and, and figuring out. But um, the problem with doing laser was five years later, 50% of them would recur. So you, they would continue to leak and, and then more laser treatment and bigger scotomas. And eventually uh, it would turn into a fibrotic uh, mess after, after time. And then now we do injections of anti-VEGF and the patient's vision improves instead of getting worse. So it was a big, huge development when this was working quite well. And now we have an implant that delivers the drug over a long period of time, six months, and then you refill that uh, device and then it will keep delivering drug to the patient so that they never have to get an, in oh, they only get uh, uh, an injection every six months and it's to refill the device. And uh, this is the Argus uh, artificial retina. Basically it takes the signal that's delivered to the retina and it sends it directly to the brain instead of using the visual process of the patient. Uh, okay, so now we have a case. Uh, we got a nine-year-old white female whose vision is 20-20, comes into the eye center with a view like this. Anyone wanna tackle that? What do you see? What, what's abnormal about this retina? Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll help you along here. So there's uh, changes in the pigment almost in, in a tracking manner. What's that? What, so what, what kind of uh, problem would show uh, changes in the RPE cells in a tracking manner? A worm, yeah, actually a maggot. So this is a... A patient who had a, a botfly larva, and the botfly larva had a, a, an affinity for the RPE cells. And so it would move along, it would track along, it would kind of gobble up these cells. And typically they can't get out of the eye. So they actually encapsulate and they stay there and, uh, and die, basically. And so a, a couple of, other, these are other cases of it. Usually they're children for some reason, I'm not sure why. Um, but this, this one actually uh, caused a hemorrhage where it encapsulated up. And the photograph in the lower right actually was taken by Danielle, and it shows the, the little worm uh, in mid vitreous, so that uh, and it really didn't have anywhere to go. So it just kind of died in, the, in that area. So uh, very telling. But these are kind of very strange cases. A uh, nine year old white female presents, um, and the only kind of clue we had was the patient was on Adderall. Uh, so they come in and they look like this. And I, I, I think we never followed up on this patient. So we re really never knew why there was this massive bilateral vascular occlusive disease going on. So um, Adder Adderall doesn't really do, what was that? Maybe she never came back, yeah. This is a Teske patient. Um, so we really never knew why this vascular occlusive problem was developing in this nine-year-old. Much greater doses of Adderall than was indicated. Ah. That was significant in the history. Uh, Twenty-one-year-old black female. Uh, we did an angiogram. The angiogram turns out like this. Anyone know uh, what would be in your differential for this? Sorry. 
So this particular patient has sickle cell disease. And uh, uh, I think they developed more of these kind of little C fans that were out in the periphery um, later on. Um, the, the typical cases that I used to see were the, you would have these um, C fans and way out in the periphery, and then you would have kind of a blank space of circulation. So when you did the angiogram, that would, there was no peripheral circulation, but you would have these things that would leak profusely. So this is the angiogram on those. They, you can see them leak, and then you can see um, that this whole peripheral area is ischemic. Uh, anyone want to tackle? Anyone ever seen this before? Yes. Bilateral. Patient was on Thorazine. So this is a Thorazine toxicity that developed on this particular patient. Another drug, uh, this patient was on Meloril. So Meloril toxin. Uh, we, we also had a case, uh, uh, patients would, would take these um, tanning uh, solutions, canthoxanthine. And so they would spread, spread this material on their skin to artificially tan the, their skin. And canthoxanthine will produce something similar along this kind of crystalline deposits in the retina too. Uh, now, does anyone see anything abnormal on this? Right. Uh, if you look really closely and hallucinate, there was actually a kind of a, a, a ring around the fovea um, slight discoloration. Um, is it elevated? What's that? Is it elevated? Uh, not, not elevated. elevated. No. Um, in fact, it's depressed. So this is what the OCT looks like. And you can see that the photoreceptor line is just snaps down to the RPG and uh, on those two areas. And uh, there's you see kind uh, of concentric ring around. Center. Anyone want to hazard a guess on this one? Plaquenil. Yeah, this is plaquenil toxicity. So our goal in doing photography and OCTs on plaquenil patients is so that they don't reach this kind of end stage. So we want to detect very small changes so that they can taper the dosage back. Um, and I think everybody's been really, really careful. So this is kind of a really rare occurrence, but it's kind of good to have a, a reference point of what the worst possible outcome can be with Plaquenil so that you can kind of uh, back off the dosage and make sure they don't get worse. This is the autofluorescent photograph of it. So it, and again, the typical Plaquenil patients that we see on a screening basis don't have any of, any of these symptoms. So it's, it's very rare to see the toxicity level. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure of the age, uh, the vision was terrible, um, but this particular patient had uh, this very odd looking kind of red and yellow and dark pigmented areas. Um, this, uh, I'll, I'll show a few more photographs. So this is the OCT showing uh, kind of this subretinal area is very complex, complicated and then this uh, fluid, subretinal fluid there. Uh, anyone want to hazard a guess on this? The telltale was doing an ultrasound. The ultrasound showed a very highly reflective subretinal area. And so the, the highly reflective subretinal area was actually bone tissue. So this is choroidal osteoma. And this was what the angiogram looked like. So it, it uptake the dye in this, uh, where that subretinal fluid was. And you can see a very hyperfluorescent area of this uh, choroidal osteoma. A uh, 45 year old white male comes in 2020 in the right eye and 2100 in the left eye. And you can see there's these kind of dark areas in this subretinal space uh, surrounding the optic nerve in, in this left eye. 
and uh, a, a big area inferiorly. It did the ang ICG angiography, and this is what the result was. Anyone hazard a guess on what this is? Great example of polychoidal choroidopathy. So it, usually there are small grape-like structures. This one had a very complex network of these blood vessels that were surrounding the optic nerve and leaking. And the best way to show this was doing ICG. You, would, you wouldn't see as much of the detail of those blood vessel networks with a regular fluorescein. So ICG was more, more helpful on that. Uh, does anyone know what's going on here? Kind of a sectoral filling of the veins that we can see here. And uh, there, so there must be a, an occlusion going on. And what's going on, what's happening during the angiogram is the veins are trying to collect dye to take away, but they are not, they can't perfuse the dye nearly as well as they should. And so the, you see this kind of sectoral filling. And uh, it's somewhat pathognomonic for this particular disease. This is our patient with SUSAC's disease. Uh, this patient who had very aggressive uh, laser photocoagulation, um, and now they have this kind of small area. The retina that's left and healthy thought it was an interesting photograph. Um, so the Pascal laser is able to distribute these laser treatments and grid therapy very successful. This particular patient wants to regrow ne do neovascularization despite this particular treatment. So um, probably needs a few more grids or maybe anti-VEGF therapy to decrease that neovascularization. This was a patient who, uh, this was a Vitali patient who uh, was terrible diabetic and didn't really come in until her disease was really advanced. And the reason she didn't come in was because she didn't have insurance. And so the, the diabetic retinopathy was really horrible when she finally first presented. And so it was kind of a, a catch up, try to catch up. Um, patient died about maybe 10 or 12 years into being treated. And uh, I think the, her diabetic retinopathy was affecting the other organs and everything else. But she was actually a young patient. Paul, you probably remember this particular patient too. A yeah. lot. I think we were doing about a Redwood. She was at we Redwood. Doing at Redwood, yeah. She was homeless part of the time. Well, kind of, so, wonderful thing about the Optos is you have this incredible panoramic view. This particular patient had very limited circulation. So they did the endogram, and there was just this tiny little area that was being circulated with the dye. Um, so massive occlusions going on and uh, really not no peripheral circulation whatsoever. Uh, does anyone know why the this central blood vessel is brighter than the other? Yeah. Oh. It's a ciliar retinal artery. Ciliar retinal artery. Yeah. So ciliar retinal artery is being fed by the coronal circulation. So it's it's, it's going to light up fast. So we, we see a difference between the arterioles from the central retinal artery versus the ciliar retinal artery. And so the beauty of the ciliar retinal artery is it's an insurance policy from central retinal artery occlusion. So now the ciliar retinal artery is now allowing circulation to occur in that papillomacular bundle area where this patient would normally be completely blind. So now they, they at least they have a window of vision because of the ciliar retinal artery. Now we've had a few of those. So this is another one. Uh, you can see the cherry red spot right here where the fovea is, but uh, they actually have some useful vision that's still viable in that area where the papillomech, or where the ciliar retinal artery. Now, I, I think Paula, you've seen this patient. They have a ciliar retinal artery that almost went across the entire retinal uh, uh, horizontal raphe. And, and so they, they're, central retinal artery occlusion was minimal. They actually had foveal activity going. And so the probability of a ciliar retinal artery in the general population is 32%. One in 37 patients with an artery occlusion have a ciliar retinal artery, so about 3%.
So it's, it's rare, but it's, again, it's this little nice insurance policy to keep the vision going despite the occlusion. Now, uh, there was a period of time that these patients were coming in that were really sick, they were really thin, they had cytomegalovirus, and they had Carposi sarcomas, and th they, they really didn't know what, what was going on until later on. And so they finally figured out, this is patients with HIV, and uh, they started treating them with antivirals, but th we had this huge population of patients that were coming in um, we were doing part of the study of SOCA, the, the um, ocular uh, uh, patients that, were, that had this disease um, in AIDS, and uh, we hardly see this anymore because the antivirals and the, and the AIDS medications are, are quite doing their job, and so we don't really see this to any degree that we used to. This is a patient who had a filtering bleb and the filtering bleb actually grew onto the surface of the cornea. And uh, so they delaminated this thing and pulled it off and put it back. And then it grew back again. And um, so if you looked at it sideways, and did a kind of a sclerotic scatter, you could appreciate that this uh, tissue could be delaminated, taken away, and then put back. And so, uh, you know, successful operation, just a very odd looking thing that was interesting to photograph. Ended up on the cover of a journal and won an award for slit lamp photography. Uh, patients that come in with irritable corneal epithelial syndrome, ice syndrome. What happens is the iris decomposes and it clogs up the trabecular mesh where they get glaucoma. But they have these incredible iris formations that were very interesting to photograph and uh, retroilluminate. And uh, when we did specular microscopy, you could actually see the demarcation line between the normal cells and the ones that were affected by the ice syndrome. So again, irritable corneal epithelial. This patient uh, was actually referred to our clinic just so that we could photograph them. And so the patient with a pseudo exfoliation, but it was a really interesting case uh, because of the detail that was uh, in this particular eye. Now, the, the interesting thing about pseudoexfoliation is the movement of the iris actually creates this kind of dead zone of the pseudoexfoliation. So when the iris uh, expands and contracts, it actually kind of scrubs that area of the capsule and it keeps it a, a little bit cleaner. And then the area, the rest of the capsule gets really frosted up. These are some other, uh, it ended up on the Journal of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. And these are just some more examples of that. This is actually a gonio photograph. So you can actually see some of the deposits that are also in the angle uh, on this particular patient. A uh, patient with Marfan syndrome, uh, their zonules kind of release. They're weak, and they allow the lens to sublux, and, and uh, they're quite interesting. They're, they're like harp strings that we normally can't see because the lens is usually in the proper place. But when, when you see these, they're very distinct and very different to look at and photograph. And this is actually a specular mic a, a micrograph uh, of the zonules from the inside of the eye looking out. And so you can see how they integrate into the lens of the eye and attach to the ciliary process. Okay, this, uh, anyone want to hazard a, a guess on this one? Dr. Bernstein, have you ever seen this before? I have, but I'm not. Okay, you're going to have to give it a little more history. Okay, patient has stationary night blindness, and when you dark adapt them, it goes away. It's Oguchi's. Oguchi's disease. Uh, so if you sit this patient in, in a dark room for 20 minutes, that kind of golden uh, flecking that you see out on the temporal side, it actually goes away and you ha they have a normal fundus reflex. And uh, that's called the Mizuho phenomenon. And so uh, this is the only case I've ever seen of it. I've never actually seen it. It's that rare. Yeah. Okay. Patient uh, presents to neuro-ophthalmology 
and they have this kind of an appearance. Close up view. Wow. <laughs> so they ha have a cavernous sinus fissure. And so basically, uh, when you have kind of a compression going on around the cavernous sinus, it affects those veins that are in the inferior, uh, uh, superior ophthalmic veins. And so they get distorted as a result of this fistula. But it's a very distinctive view when you see that eye just kind of blood red like that on one side. Uh, and so it's very something that you should think about when you see that type of pattern. Uh, this is a patient who has a uh, glucoside storage disease. And it, these were also patients, uh, patients who have Hay-Sachs disease also have this kind of uh, whitish coloration. And so Hay-Sachs patients usually don't live very long. Uh, I think they live till maybe three or four years. Another uh, kind of congenital abnormality of the formation of the blood vessels. So the patient has Wyburn-Mason syndrome. And so a very odd kind of collection of, of the way these particular blood vessels grow. This one actually had circulation going right through the center of the fold. Uh, I've always been fascinated with blood vessels, especially the ones that kind of curly through around. And, and so there's a, a couple of examples of those. Uh, they, they usually don't do anything. They're, they're just abnormal and fun. Another thing is uh, when an artery crosses a vein, it sometimes is a lead pipe on a rubber hose and it can cause a, those occlusions. So it, it's always interesting to see where these vessel crossings occur uh, on these particular patients. So when I, when I looked at blood vessels and, and trees, I kind of combined the two. This was actually a canopy of oak trees in my backyard in Atlanta. And so, uh, so I just photographed by looking straight up and, and again, science and art at the same time, I was thinking of a fovea, and I connected the branches of the of blood vessels to the branches of the trees. And um, this was one best in show, and it was on the cover of the Journal of Ophthalmic Photography. Uh, this patient with retinitis pigmentosa, and typical appearance is kind of these, uh, starts out in the periphery, moves its way in. Um, and Dr. Bernstein, this was an interesting patient who had the expression of Retinitis pigmentosa on the nasal side. And so the temporal side was completely normal. Um, so it was uh, not sure what their particular gene would do for to do that. But anyways, it was an interesting presentation. Was it bilateral, symmetrical or bilateral? Yes, it was bilateral. Yeah. Okay, patient comes into your uh, clinic and you look at their skin and you notice that something's going on in their skin. What, what do you suspect could be going on in the retina? Right. So this particular skin ailment is pseudoxanthoma elasticum. And so pseudoxanthoma elasticum is typically seen in patients who have angioid streaks. So android streaks are cracks in Brooks membrane. And uh, they, they're, uh, the eye is somewhat fragile as a result of uh, this particular condition. So, and it, they also can develop uh, coronal neovascularization because they, these blood vessels find an opportune area in the crack and they grow through and they leak. And back in the laser days, it was kind of like playing whack-a-mole because you would laser one area and then another one would pop up and you'd laser that one, another one would pop up. And so the, these were kind of difficult to manage back in the laser days. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if anti-VEGF therapy has improved dramatically on that. They have, okay. Um, the, we, we actually had a patient, this was your patient, Dr. Bernstein, who had android streaks and they were in a car accident. And so as a result, their fairly quiet eye turned into kind of a mess after the car accident. So again, it shows kind of the brittle nature of android streaks that occur in these particular patients, um, and, and they get a trauma. There's a, also a young 
boy that had uh, got hit in the eye with a soccer ball, and, and that eye ended up going blind as a result, who also had android streaks. Uh, Gonio photography was a, a challenge because um, when I first did this, they said, oh, well, uh, we want you to photograph inside a, a mirror while you're holding this onto a, an eye uh, on a breathing, blinking patient who likes to ho hopefully hold still, but but you you have to photograph in that little mirror. And I said, oh, okay, well, I'll give that a try. And um, so you get, you get really good at it. So these are actually patients who have... Uh, a little cyst, um, tumor. Um, the, the one on the upper part, you can actually see the tumor through the keyhole of the pupil, as well as the angle. So, and, and the whole idea of doing gonio photography for melanomas is, is there angle involved? So you want to see if there's any growth or pigmented areas that are in the angle. So when they're isolated by this, then you know they're not in the angle. This is a patient in the middle with Axenfeld Rieger's anomaly. So they actually had an adhesions of the iris to the cornea. Uh, so it's challenging, but it was also very uh, interesting and fun to do to get a really clear image. Uh, trans illumination. Um, this is a patient with iritis, and uh, they were a, a patient with Akbar, and uh, wanted to show that the Sclera was also involved. So this scleritis showed a lack of pigment around there too. And uh, so able to demonstrate that. You actually have to overexpose the image by like two or three stops in order to get a, a useful photograph. And so um, that's what we would do. This one on the left is actually an albino patient. And our fundus camera has this little cable, it's called a PC cable. And you can actually take it off the, the normal camera that would sit on the fundus camera, and you could put it on a handheld camera. So I took that PC cable, I put it on a handheld camera, and then when I took the picture, my fundus camera flash would go off, and I could take a, a, a ring picture of, of where the ring of light goes into the eye. Now, the, there's always a shadow in the fundus camera in order to not get a reflection in your retina image. And so this demonstrated that as well as the lack of pigment in this patient with albinism. And so it was a kind of a fun little project that I did. Some more transillumination defects, patients with uh, where, where the iris pigment was coming apart and clogging the patient's trabecular meshwork, causing glaucoma. And then this was our patient, Dr. Bernstein, this was your patient who was on the uh, gene therapy uh, for uh, choroideremia. And as a result, uh, Dr. Bernstein noticed that their iris pigment was changing. And so we now incorporate this uh, transillumination photograph into the study to see if their drug is also affecting their iris. Uh, it's more slit lamp photograph. This is a patient who was in a car accident and the lens prolapsed to the anterior chamber. And uh, so they had very successful cataract surgery. They just didn't remove the, the rest of the lens again. A uh, patient with posterior length of conus. So the, the bottom of the lens is shaped like a cone. These are patient with, a, a patient with pigment cells that are on the capsule. This is a patient that... Um, Alan Crandall sent, who has these kind of hexagonal little deposits in the lens cap. It's a polar cataract, so congenital cataract. Uh, positive Seidel test. And then these are uh, the beauty of doing fluorescence photography on the surface of the cornea. So to be very successful, you want to clean up and make sure that there's no tear film that's also fluorescent. So you want to put the fluorescein strip on and then mop it up. And that way you get a much cleaner view of what's going on. Patient with um, scars that are also from the uh, herpes zoster virus. Uh, another thing that we were doing was photographing the nerves on the cornea. And the nerves appear in that kind of sub-basal layer of the cornea. And uh, when you look at the different sections of the cornea, you can see that there's kind of bifurcations and they all kind of point upwards. 
And so if you put the puzzle together, there's actually this kind of little vortex going on in the very center um, as these nerves kind of emanate out from the cornea. It's not in the dead center, it's kind of inferiorly. And so it looks like this when you blow it up. Now, the beauty of, of these, um, this particular pattern is it shows up again in a patient who has amiodarone. So they are on a heart medication, and somehow that deposits onto these nerve cells. And you can see that vortex pattern very distinctly now because of the deposits there. Herpes, uh, herpes zoster virus. And they, they affect the nerves as well. This was a very interesting patient who had um, fibrosis. Uh, they had laser treatment, and they were. This was a patient that I saw at Emory who actually moved out to Salt Lake, and I kept seeing the patient. And so we would talk about. He would tell me that he was um, treated by Paul Sternberg, and now he sees uh, Dr. Teske, I think. And um, and I look at the, this retina, and it's it's like a bomb went off, right? And so uh, thinking along the lines of if this patient had developed these symptoms later on when anti-VEGF therapy, he'd still be reading a newspaper and driving a car. And so the difference in his lifestyle is completely changed as a result of when he developed those symptoms and the technology that was there to develop and, and treat. The, an interesting phenomenon happens uh, to a, a certain group of patients. We don't really know why. When you do a fluorescein angiography, there's a, this weird migration of the dye out to the surface of the skin in a very high concentrated area. And so uh, a, a fun thing to do that I thought was, let's photograph this with a blue light with an external camera. And so this is what it looks like when you do that. And so these were kind of three that I've experienced um, of these patients that have this non-painful vascular staining as a result of doing an angiogram. And it just migrates out to the arm. You see it immediately because um, it's very distinct and uh, different patterns. And sometimes it stains the blood vessels. And it was actually published in the Journal of Ophthalmic Photography, somebody else's photographs as well. Uh, so cavernous hemangioma. So a beautiful little collection of uh, grape-like uh, little angiomas that occur. This particular patient had one inferior to the nerve, and we did an angiogram, and this was the pattern. And how am I doing on time? Six minutes, okay. Uh, this was a patient who had angiomas, and uh, they were, we did a series of these back at Emory, um, Auber, Tom Auberg's Jr. published an article on uh, using Vitorporin photodynamic therapy to shrink these angiomas. And so he would inject them with a vertorferin and treat them with a cold laser. Uh, this is a 51 year old white female presented to imaging with a working diagnosis of uh, Nevis. This was Dr. Katz's patient. And so there was kind of the collection of these dark brown areas. Um, something clicked in my mind that this possibly could be iron deposits. So I asked the patient if they were taking any iron supplements. And they said, no, but you've hit on something interesting because I have a condition. Um, these were kind of similar photographs that I'd taken that looked like that type of thing, where she has hemochromatosis. So she can't metabolize the, uh, where the iron builds up in the body. And it's called an iron overload. Normally, the intestines absorb the right amount of iron from food, and the body absorbs too much iron and has no way to get rid of it, and they have arthritis symptoms. So uh, I actually, uh, the patient helped me make this diagnosis of what was going on in their uh, anterior segment. Um, some other deposits that occur uh, is actually copper in the eye. This patient with Wilson's disease, a, we call this the Kaiser Fleischer ring where the demarcation line of this, these deposits around the periphery. This is a patient who's had it quite, for quite a few years. Um, another patient who had deposits in the anterior chamber, this was a patient who couldn't handle the amino acid cysteine. So cysteine deposits occurred there 
with a patient with cystinosis. And this is a, a patient who had metal in the eye, and the metal would decompose and then redeposit. And so this is our patient with siderosis bulbi. Some of the similar things that occur, patient with neurofibromatosis. So they would have Lish nodules on the surface of the iris, and, and you would see these kind of distinctive deposits. So these were um, patients that I had seen. Hemorrhages uh, occur. This is a patient who had an avulsion of the optic nerve, tremendous amounts of blood that were in the vitreous, um, spontaneous iris hemorrhage, eight ball hyphema. This is a patient, so uh, it, this is an earlier photograph of kind of a microaneurysm that turned into a macroaneurysm. And the spontaneous iris hemorrhage was in the INET magazine. Um, so th this is interesting. Uh, Anyone hazard a guess on this one? Patient has leukemia. So these are uh, retinal hemorrhages from leukemia. And they are uh, dis distinctive patterns. Um, what was interesting is you, you could see this pattern on another problem. This patient who had carbon monoxide poisoning. Carbon monoxide poison uh, filled their house, and so they became hypoxic. And so as a result, they had very similar kind of presentation as this patients with leukemia. And then this is a patient with hemophilia. And so they also have these uh, distinctive hemorrhage with raw spots um, and uh, very similar to the patients that also had these other presentations. Things that uh, form uh, before the, uh, these are kind of fetal developments that you don't normally see. This is a patient with the tunica vasculosa lentis and uh, persistent pupillary membranes that also occur. Colobomas, complete information of complete formation of the rest of the retina. And so you kind of see a group of these uh, different colobomas that occur. Uh, another thing is so morning glory syndrome. So again, a coloboma near the optic nerve. Uh, the one in the lower right is actually showing you fluid that developed as a result of a pit in the optic nerve. So cerebral spinal fluid will actually leach out into the subretinal uh, uh, or in the delaminate the retina and show you this little fluid. Morning glory. Uh, this is a, a patient who has optic pit. You can see the pit in that fundus photograph and then the dispersion of fluid that goes out onto the retina. This is a patient who had the same thing, optic pit, but they had kind of a light bulb looking area of fluid uh, that was very distinctive as well. This is what the OCT looked like. And so when there's a, a hole, it allows that fluid to migrate out into that area. And depending on where that hole is uh, up or down will depend on the layer of retina that's also infiltrated with fluid. Uh, this was an interesting patient came in with a very hazy looking cornea, wasn't seeing well. This was a Mifflin patient, uh, did a, a, a slit lamp photograph. And you can see these kind of refractile reflections of these little filaments. The patient was on a experimental uh, cancer drug. And so as a result of the, the drug, it was causing these deposits in the cornea. Cataracts, different cataracts. The beauty of the cataract is you have these suture lines, and the suture lines can also get affected. How these cause these star cataracts to occur. The one in the, right here looks like the FTD floor. Uh, you don't always have to photograph straight on. So the beauty of taking a side view is you can see the topography of the cornea, and uh, so. The, patients who have uh, abnormally shaped corneas, as well as deposits. It's kind of an interesting view to look at it sideways. And then look at a progression with patients with vitelliform dystrophy. Almost looks like a mitotic division in that April 19. Um, does anyone notice anything abnormal about this run? Not really, right? So over a period of 10 years, this particular retina did this. 
maybe maybe we need artificial intelligence to discern what you know what pathway the retina is going to go through. But if we look at this kind of ten year span, a normal retina went to this horrible subretinal hemorrhage. Another thing occurs with geographic atrophy. This is over a six year period of time of taking autofluorescent photographs. Now, in this particular pa patient, the fovea was somewhat spared um, over a period of time, but you can see lipofusion deposits getting hyperfluorescent areas, and uh, and then the areas where the RPE is no longer functioning anymore. Hemorrhages, subretinal hemorrhages. We don't see that anymore because of the anti-VEGF. Um, this was a nine-year-old patient that was hit in the eye with a stick. And so we would see them uh, once a week in, in order to photograph and document the retina clearing. And so uh, we, we did this wonderful series, but nobody asked for the picture of the child. <clears throat> so I took this on my own and said, hey, you know what? We need a document. And pictures tell a story. And this is uh, just part of this uh, ability to see what really went on with this particular patient from the outside of the eye as well. <clears throat> so I guess the take home message is, look at the outside of the body as well. Patients with pseudoxanthoma elasticum, patients who would get hit in the eye is sick and, and request that photograph so that we can help tell the story as well. Give them what they need, not just what they ask for. <clears throat> Okay, I, so I think I'm going to conclude here because we're a little after the end. Any questions? Love to come back. Let me know if you need another lecture.